Uh, her name was Bella, or at least that's the name that we have for her on the list of uh, the property that Margareta MacDonald inherited. Uh, and she appears on an inventory list as Moco Bella, Moco indicating um, uh, a place in, um, in what is today Nigeria. We don't know much about Bella, but we do know she was in her <coughs> early 30s in 1795, uh, and so she must have been born in the early um, 1760s. We know that she worked in sugar production in the north of Jamaica as part of what was known as a jobbing gang, which is uh, a group of enslaved people who were rented from one owner uh, to work on somebody else's property and thus uh, suffered among the most severe exploitation of the system of slavery. Almost certainly she'd come to Jamaica on one of the many slave ships that arrived there in the 1780s from the area that's today the most southerly part of Nigeria. Uh, and that means that she must have grown up in a small community that was undergoing massive transformations at the time due to increasing demands from European slave traders at the coast. Uh, this was a place that she lived in, uh, in which life was becoming more and more insecure, uh, and she was one of the people caught up in that insecurity. <coughs> she spent at least 40 years working on Seville Estate in St. Anne in Jamaica, um, and as far as I can tell from the sources, she probably died in 1832, which means that she died two years before um, people in Jamaica became free. So what I'd like you to take from this talk is not just knowledge of the money uh, from Bella's sale that benefited those who sold her. More importantly, I want us to try and hold Bella and people like her in our minds. I don't think we can exactly remember her because we didn't know her, but we can and should make her experience an important part of our imagined past, which is what we're doing when we're doing history, we're imagining the past. In so doing, I think we can also try to start to undo the cultural as well as the economic work that took place uh, when Bella was made into a commodity and a member of an abstract racial category. Uh, and we can try to work to bring an end to the legacy of that racialization. Uh, that is, um, and here I totally agree with how Jeff ended his talk, um, actively struggling against racism and race-based inequality in the present, and also the uh, massive and grotesque um, economic inequalities between uh, some parts of the world that benefited from uh, slavery-based property and other parts of the world that were damaged by it. Thank you. this period of history. 
But it's more than that. It's not just people sometimes call it the slink of tool, which I don't call it that because it's not just about that. It's much wider. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about a range of Caribbean people who were living here in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, and just give you a few examples to give you a sense of the range of experiences that those people have. So, for example, if we're going back to 1688, we have a baptism of a young African boy who is a servant to John, John Lanwick on the Royal Mile. So, actually, people are quite surprised when we bring it right back to that date, um, the end of the 17th century. Um, so, we have a fairly continuous presence of Caribbean people in Edinburgh in the, the centuries after that. So we have, of course, snippets of people's lives that we're trying to put together and, and try and get more of a, imagine really what their life would have been like here. So we have, for example, a mention of a, a young boy, or a teenager, who was, was referred to as Lady Stairs Black Boy, who actually lived in what is now the Writers' Museum. And that's something that the staff in the Writers' Museum don't talk about, maybe don't know about, it's not mentioned in their exhibit um, at the moment. But he was just one of several people who were living as servants in um, Edinburgh households around, around that area and around that, that time. Um, Glasgow University, I'm sure many of you know, is a website with the Runaway Slaves um, database, which shows that advertisements, first of all, for young, very young people for sale, and then also people in their teens and early 20s who were trying to escape the kinds of situation that they were in and to, to try and move out to other areas. Now, of course, these adverts come to an end in 1788 when we have the, the Knight versus Wedderburn case, which is a landmark legal case. I'm sure Sir Jeff might want to talk about that a little bit more later on. So some of you might know about that. After, at that point, these runaway slave adverts end because it is a case that was brought by a young man from Jamaica, Joseph Knight, who was brought over by John Wedderburn, who um, Jeff is talking about, that same Wedderburn family. Um, so it becomes a landmark decision in 1788, where he eventually wins his case as a long protracted um, case. And after that, it is considered, it is, um, Slavery is, um, is, is not legal in Scotland. But having said that, there was, there was a case about 100 years before called the Tumbling Bassey case of 1687. And this is key. And I'm sure it's something that Sir Jeff will want to talk about a bit more. So, really, in a way, slavery wasn't even legal at the time that it's being forced out in the courts at that particular point. But it's often framed as Scotland abolished slavery in 1788. But it's a lot more complex and it's a lot more nuanced than that. And of course, it's continuing in the colonies. So it's interesting how sometimes that narrative is peddled in, in quite a lazy way and it pops up in lots of different places. Um, we also, I take people to a gravestone just at the end of Princess Street in St John's Episcopal Church graveyard. And there's a woman who's buried there called Malvina Wells who came from a small island that I used to live on for a while, called Caribou. It's a tiny island. It's three miles by five miles, and it's just off the coast of Grenada. And I actually walked on the estate that she was born on. Now, Scots actually own two-thirds of the plantations on that particular island, and they enslaved two-thirds of the population, which was about 3,000 people at that particular point. What's interesting about Caribou it's one of the very few places in the African diaspora where people can actually trace their ancestry back to certain ethnicities and they will say, I know I'm a Shanti, I know I'm Igbo, I know I'm Kamanti. And those kinds of um, cultural links are very, very strong in Karakou. Partly because of Scottish people. So you have the Oswald and Grant Consortium, they were Glasgow merchants who were operating out of London. And they had investments in that notorious slave port island, Bunce Island of Sierra Leone. And they would actually transport people directly from Bunce Island across to Karakou. And quite often, they would have people of the same ethnicities kept together for long periods of time before they were actually going onto the ship and actually taken across together. So in amongst all the horror of this, there's a small silver lining in it because 
people were able to keep their culture together in a way that you don't necessarily find in other places in the same kind of way. So what we've been having now is reunions with people, ethnic groups from Karakou, getting together with the same ethnic groups in West Africa, so like the Temne people of Sierra Leone, and actually coming together and relearning the spirituality, relearning the language that's been lost, relearning um, dance and music and food and all of those things that were destroyed through the, the transatlantic slave trade. So these kinds of connections are starting to happen again, which I think is really exciting. <laughs> I'm not talking too much, though. So. Um, we also have people like the Shaw family, where we've got mixed race people um, coming from Jamaica, for example, who actually inherited enslaved people themselves, and they marry into the Edinburgh elite, for example. We have um, abolitionists like Robert Wedderburn, so again, it's connected to the Wedderburn family. This is James Wedderburn's mixed race son, who I'm sure Jeff would, Joe Jeff told this story extremely well about how he shows up on his father's doorstep and the kind of treatment that he has. But he goes on to be an amazing abolitionist and he becomes part of this multiracial revolutionary movement. And he's somebody, I think, if we start thinking about maybe memorialising different people in Edinburgh, maybe creating new statues or, or maybe renaming streets after um, certain people, he would definitely be a contender in my mind. Um, we have people like John Edmonston, I'm sure some of you will know about John Edmonston, who was a man who was formerly enslaved, brought from Guyana, and he lived very close to here. He lived about three doors down from um, Charles Darwin. And he actually taught Charles Darwin taxidermy and taught him a lot about the flora and fauna of South America. And they think without his knowledge, Charles Darwin would not have come up with the theory of evolution in the way that he did. So for me, it's really interesting looking at the knowledge strands that are brought in from other places and not credited. And you see that um, again and again, a lot of information that's maybe taken from very sophisticated African healthcare systems in the Caribbean that then end up in the journals in, in Edinburgh as well. So that's a really interesting area to look up. How am I doing the time? So again, so many things that we can discuss. I hope this is the first of a great deal of conversations that we can have. I'm really excited to hear what Diana just said about um, the decisions within the university here and looking into um, reparative justice and what kinds of shapes that might take. So, for example, um, if we're thinking about trying to heal the legacies of racism within Scotland itself, then understanding how race and racial hierarchies and the idea of whiteness that's constructed as a power construct, arbitrary and changeable, it's not an attack on white people. I think if people can really understand those things and teachers in schools can um, explain how all these things came about and the fact that these ideas are fairly new and then they can be deconstructed much more easily. It's not something that's, that feel, people feel that it that is natural in any way. Um, I think sometimes the fact that people are very proud of the Scottish Enlightenment here, it gets in the way sometimes of the analysis with you know, ideas from people like Hume and others. Um, teachers are often quite under confident, they don't have the language, and they're not really trained to be reflective also. So I think all of these things are important to make sure that teachers, when they have the information, that they deliver this information very sensitively, especially if you've got a multicultural classroom. Um, I also think there's a lot of work to be done, of course, within the university itself. Sometimes I hear stories from black students here about racism that's going on within the university. I think there's a lot of work to be done in addressing that, because often when I speak to professors, they're quite surprised that these kinds of incidences are happening, and there seems to be a little bit of a gap there. So I really hope that the university can bring people together in conversation to start to, to really have some action on that as well. Um, so in terms of decolonizing, Huge topic, I have really got many minutes left, many minutes left, but um, in terms of talking about crediting knowledge that has come from other places, um, in terms of the kinds of images that we use, the kind of being careful with the language that we use, also really important, I think, if you, those of you who are studying history and you're thinking maybe you're going into teaching, that let's say if you are um, teaching slavery, that you make sure that you teach African civilizations and um, 
culture before you start to introduce that topic. I think that's really, really important that we make sure that's done. Um, and as Daniel was saying, making sure that um, names and identities are um, always talked about as far as possible. Um, and encouraging perspective taking. Whose perspective are you taking, especially if you're teaching in a, in a school classroom? What kind of empathy are you trying to create for people's experiences? And also linking to today's problems, but also showing it very explicitly how we move from that period to after so-called emancipation, where the working conditions in places like Jamaica are extremely, extremely difficult. And we notice how lots of the economic oppression is continuing right through to the present day today. So in terms of independence, the Caribbean will keep its so-called independence, but political independence without economic independence doesn't really help, doesn't really make sense. So I think if, if we're really looking into reparations seriously, we have to think about how we approach trade, whether trade is fair, whether when governments in the Caribbean try to um, start to make decisions to make it make their um, to, to make sure that it's beneficial for, the, for their own people, that there isn't political interference constantly from the outside, or that we're making sure that we protest when we realise that these things are happening. And it's the same thing with connecting to the Windrush scandal, it's the same thing with the deportations. It can't just be Caribbean people or people who are directly affected who are standing up and protesting and making sure that we are making our voices heard. It has to be everybody. Um, so there's, there's a lot more I can say, but I haven't got time right now, so I'm sure in our discussion we can talk about that a bit more. We just have quite a few things I wanted to say about the different ways that we could approach comparative justice. So thank you.